giving an account to your majesty, we find that from four years ago down to the present, half of the Indians have died because of the great plagues and contagious disease that they have suffered. So reads a letter to the King of Spain from a Franciscan friar who had been told to convert the Florida Indians to Christianity. It demonstrates the toll that European introduced disease had taken on the native Indian populations. The Calusa, a people who once ruled all of South Florida, managed to survive as a culture for more than 200 years after contact with the Spaniards while other equally complex societies in Central and South America were in cultural ruin within a generation. Who were these people the Spanish called Calusa? Why are there no Calusa alive in Florida today? What lessons can be learned by tracing their history? Much of what we know about the Calusa comes from Spanish records, in 1566, Pedro Menendez de Aviles sailed into the Bay of Carlos near the mouth of the Calusahatchee River and the Calusa seat of power. Menendez held the title of Adelantado, meaning that he was charged by the King of Spain with the subjugation, settlement, and governance of Florida. On this voyage, Menendez hoped to find shipwrecked Spaniards who were rumored to be living as captives among the Indians. As the party of Spaniards made its way along the coast, a lone canoe set out from shore and approached them. In that canoe was the Spaniard Escalante Fontaneda, who almost 20 years prior had been stranded among the Indians. Fontaneda was a boy of 13 when his parents sent him and his brother from Peru to Spain to receive an education. During the voyage, their ship was wrecked on the east coast of Florida. Most of the Spaniards who made it ashore were killed, but Fontaneda was spared. Upon his rescue, he wrote a memoir concerning the native peoples of Florida. Carlos, a uh, province of Indians, which in their language signifies a fierce people, they are so called for being brave and skillful, as in truth they are. These Indians have no gold, less silver, and less clothing. They go naked, except only some breech cloth woven of palm, with which the men cover themselves. The women do the like with a certain grass that grows on trees. This grass looks like wool, although it is different from it. That people understand the greater part of our strategy and our archers and uh, men of strength. On these islands are many deer and a certain animal that looks like a fox, yet it is not, but a different thing from it. Several days after meeting Fontaneda, Menendez paid a visit to the Calusa king, Carlos, at his principal town. That town is thought to have stood here on what is today appropriately called Mound Key. The Adelantado went to dine with Carlos taking 200 arquebusiers with him and a flag, two fifers and drummers, three trumpeters, one harp, one violin, and one psaltery, and a very small dwarf, a great singer and dancer. He entered the king's house where 2,000 men might gather without being very crowded. The Calusa king was impressed by Menendez's display of strength. He hoped that by allying himself with the Spaniards, he might gain a military advantage over his own enemies and so swore allegiance to Menendez. To seal the agreement, Carlos gave the Spaniard his sister for a wife and a celebration commenced. More than 500 Indian girls from 10 to 15 years who were seated outside the window began to sing and other Indians danced and whirled. The Adelantado gave them beads, scissors, knives, bells and mirrors, wherewith they were much pleased, especially at the mirrors. Menendez ordered that a fort be built and stationed a Jesuit priest named Juan Rogel there to take on the work of converting the Calusa. Father Rogel lived at the fort for a little over a year. His letters, 
not only demonstrate the futility of his attempts to move the Calusa from their tradition, but the degree to which their beliefs were part of the very fabric of their lives. The Calusa say that each man has three souls. One is the little pupil of the eye. Another is the shadow that each one casts. And the last is the image of oneself that each one sees in a mirror or in a calm pool of water. And when a man dies, they say that two of the souls leave the body and that the third one, which is the pupil of the eye, remains in the body always. And thus, they go to the burial place to speak with the deceased and to ask their advice. There, they learn about many things that happen in other regions or that come to pass later on. They say that when a man dies, his soul enters into some animal or fish, and when they kill such an animal, it enters into another lesser one, so that little by little it reaches the point of being reduced into nothing. They said to me that their forebears had lived under this law from the beginning of time, and that they also wanted to live under it, that I should let them be, that they did not want to listen to me. Although other native groups to the north of the Calusa, such as the Tumukua and the Wale, would prove to be receptive to Christianity, the Calusa stubbornly resisted Father Rohel's instruction. There may have been uh, these reasons to help us understand that. Number one, Father Rohel insisted that the chief abandon his incestuous relationship with his sister. Uh, secondly, Father Rohel insisted that the idols of the people be destroyed. And third, the Spaniards were very violent in their behavior toward the Calusa, killing two of their chiefs. The eventual collapse of the protective line of Spanish missions and garrisons across North Florida brought a new threat to the Calusa's survival. The final destruction of the Indian societies came at the hands of the English, first from Carolina, then from Georgia. English raiders with Indian allies came into Florida, particularly the raid of 1704 stands out, the largest slaving raid in the history of our country, thousands of Appalachians taken back to Carolina. But slaving raids continued all through the first part of the 18th century against what were called the Spanish Indians, and those raids combined with the introduction of European diseases caused the extinction of the original people, including the Calusa. The few native Florida Indians who escaped to Cuba died of disease or fared poorly in the face of their steadfast refusal to become farmers. The Calusa were fisher folk and raised no crops. Their distaste for farming confounded the Spaniards who perceived their unwillingness to till the soil as a sign of laziness. Cloaked as they were in the traditions of their own culture, the Spaniards were unable or unwilling to see the validity of the Calusa way of life. The truth is that the Calusa were a highly productive and complex people. They were skilled artisans and had a highly organized society with nobles and commoners and well-defined social roles. The vast bounty of the estuary in which they lived provided them with enough food to support a leisure class without the need for agriculture, and they became powerful enough to demand tribute from other Indian groups across South Florida. This is virtually unique among Native American peoples. For most cultures, agriculture is a keystone in the development of a complex society. Despite their sophistication and influence, the Calusa could not withstand forever the pressures that came as a result of the European presence. By the mid-1700s, the Calusa, a people who had flourished for centuries, a people who had ruled all of South Florida, had vanished. As Florida came under British control, it was repopulated by native peoples from the north, while the Calusa and their amazing story slipped into the mists of obscurity. In late February of 1895, the schooner Silver Spray left the port at Tarpon Springs, Florida and turned southward toward the waters of Charlotte Harbor. 
At the helm was Frank Hamilton Cushing, an anthropologist from the Smithsonian Institution. Cushing's small expedition was on its way to investigate stories of unusual artifacts unearthed from the muck of Marco Island. Among the team Cushing brought with him was a 32-year-old artist named Wells Sawyer. It was Sawyer's task to document the expedition through sketches, photographs, and paintings. Sawyer's journal and letters provide a wonderful chronicle of the expedition's daily events. As the schooner dropped southward toward the sparsely populated tip of Florida, Sawyer was struck by the remarkable beauty of the huge estuarine system that dominates the Gulf Coast. It is a world of water dotted with islands which look like great green buttons on the beautiful sea. But the colors of the Gulf are unlike those one sees on the Atlantic. And these islands, or keys, differ too from those of northern waters. Sawyer quickly realized the importance of the tangled red mangrove trees whose prop roots formed the foundation of the small sheltering islands through which they traveled. It is here that the savage found the natural conditions favorable to his needs. Each mangrove key is bordered by an oyster fringe and is also the rookery of cormorant, curlew, or other bird. Three days later, the expedition began work in a mangrove thicket near the homestead of Captain Bill Collier. Ditches were dug to drain the excavation area. By bailing and trenching, the team was able to lower the water table enough to make excavation possible, although the conditions were less than pleasant. Cushing's account of the process bears his trademark flamboyance and a keen sense of the dramatic. I deem it unnecessary to give further details of our operations, save to say that three or four of us worked side by side in each section, digging inch by inch and foot by foot through the muck and rich lower strata, standing or crouching the while in puddles of mud and water. And as time went on, we were pestered morning and evening by swarms and clouds of mosquitoes and sand flies. And during the mid-hours of the day, tormented by the fierce tropic sun heat pouring down into this little shut-up hollow among the breathless mangroves. After the first day's work, however, I was left no longer in doubt as to the unique outcome of our excavations, howsoever difficult the task might prove to be, for relics of new and interesting varieties began at once to be found and continued to be found increasingly as we went on day after day throughout the entire five weeks of our work in this one little place. What Cushing found stunned the scientific community. The wet mangrove muck had formed an oxygen-free environment in which wood and fiber artifacts could remain intact for thousands of years. These materials he unearthed are among the most extraordinary in all of North America. But most surprising were several intricately fashioned animal and human figures that demonstrated carving and painting skills unsurpassed by any Native American culture. When Cushing returned to Washington, he faced a new problem. There was an employee at the Bureau of Ethnology named William Dinwiddie who didn't like Cushing for one reason or another. And he brought charges against Cushing, saying that he fabricated one of the artifacts, this being the shell with the dancer painted inside. He took this shell uh, without permission out of the collection and showed it to newspapers and anybody else, I guess, who would listen, trying to drum up a lot of uh, problems and a lot of furor against Cushing. Even though there were letters from the people on the expedition who had no doubt of the genuineness of the shell, uh, it still caused a lot of trouble for Cushing, and this, this haunted him. There were two institutions who sponsored this expedition. They had been promised identical moieties of artifacts, that means identical collections of artifacts, from this expedition. Very early in the expedition, Cushing realized that this was going to be impossible because there were not duplicates of the exotic artifacts that were being found. So he was having a terrible time trying to divide this collection because there were not duplicates. And then 
To complicate matters further, he died before the, the division was affected. Frank Hamilton Cushing's sudden death at the age of 42 was the final confounding event that left the key Marco collection split apart and largely uninterpreted. It seemed the Calusa had once again fallen into obscurity. In 1983, archaeologist Bill Marquard began mapping a shell mound on Jocelyn Island. Though he did not realize it at the time, Marquard had begun what would grow to become the largest comprehensive archaeological investigation of Calusa sites to date, with a team of professionals, students, and volunteers in an effort that stretches from the Spanish archives in Seville to the wet mangrove muck of Pine Island, Marquard is slowly winning back the Calusa story from oblivion. Pineland was an important Indian town and it was occupied for almost 2,000 years. But one great thing about Pineland is that it's accessible. You can drive your car to it. Archaeology is more than just searching for things or treasure hunting. Instead, it's a very disciplined search for, uh, for knowledge, for learning about the environment and about the Indians' heritage. Since the days of Cushing, a quiet revolution has taken place in archaeology. What was once primarily an object-oriented endeavor has evolved into a meticulous process of multi-phased analysis using specialists in many fields, each working on different pieces of the puzzle. During recent investigations at the Pineland site, Marquard's team included zooarchaeologists who studied the animal remains found in the site, archaeobotanists who studied the seeds, plant fiber, wood, and charcoal, soil scientists who studied the structure and chemical content of the soils, cartographers who mapped the sites, and artists who, using all the available data, worked to recreate the site as it might have looked centuries ago. Even individual shells found in the sites have a story to tell. The life history of the common quahog clam is recorded in its growth bands, which accumulate like tree rings. By cross-sectioning and studying these growth bands, archaeologists can determine what times of the year the Indians were living at certain places. New techniques such as the use of fine mesh screens have made startling differences in the accuracy of the data gathered. A casual glance at the mounds gives the overwhelming impression that the Calusa diet was primarily comprised of shellfish. This conclusion was widely held until fine mesh recovery methods were employed. As if from nowhere, thousands of tiny fish bones, too small to be caught in the larger mesh, appeared in the screens. By calculating meat weight based on the shellfish, mammal, and fish remains found in the mounds, we now know that fish comprise the largest part of the Calusa diet. Plant remains are just as revealing as animal remains. Archaeobotanists compare microscopic sections of wood and fiber found in the site against modern samples. In this way, it has been discovered that cypress wood was used for carving figureheads and masks, as well as float pegs for fishing nets. Seeds found in the mound shed light on what the Calusa ate and helped reconstruct the environment hundreds of years in the past. 2,000-year-old papaya seeds found at Pineland show that the climate then was subtropical, much like that of today. To learn more about how the ancient Calusa fished, the team turned to some experts, senior fisher folk who fished the estuary before modern technology. They remember an unpolluted harbor with virtually unlimited resources. So the, the fish today have the same size heads as the fish used to have, so you would need the same size nets today as the Calusa nets. That's, that's right, use. that's right. They and their knowledge, like the Calusa before them, are vanishing. Another technique used to learn about the Calusa is replication of their technology. Replication helps us to understand the processes necessary to create the objects found in a site. By coiling and firing pots made from local clay, we can learn what a Calusa ceramic workshop might contain. 
by twisting plant fiber into twine, we learn which plants make the strongest and most supple cord. By hafting shark teeth, we learn how well they function as knives, how effectively they carve wood, and how deadly a weapon they might make. By hollowing out a canoe from a pine tree using fire and simple hand tools, we gain insight into Calusa uses of their surroundings. To meet their needs for durable, sharp tools, the Calusa turned once more to the warm waters of the estuary. The Calusa developed their shell technology with a skill that is second to none in the world. From the hard, thick shells of massive conchs and whelks, they made adzes, axes, and hammers. From more delicate shells, they made pendants, ear buttons, cups, sinkers, and net weights. For today's archaeologists, the most exciting discoveries often happen weeks or even months after the dig has concluded in the laboratory. Hours of stratigraphic study, soils analysis and artifact study eventually lead to a comprehensive picture of the site as it looked in the past. Through computer imaging, it is possible to see a model of the Pineland site when people first began to live there about 2,000 years ago. Later, the mounds began to be built up, and by 700 years ago, Pineland was a sizable town with multiple mounds, plazas, and a great central canal. Finally, over the past century, parts of the site have been carried away for road fill and bulldozed down to fill in low areas. Because careful archaeology takes time and money, many sites are destroyed before researchers can secure the necessary funding to examine them properly and unlock their secrets. Much of the Calusa record has been obliterated by the thoughtless abuses of modern people. The few undisturbed sites remain painfully vulnerable. In an effort to raise public awareness, Marquard undertook a program that allows private citizens, school children, and teachers to share the experience of archaeological discovery firsthand. A grant from the Florida Department of State made it possible for more than 3,000 students to visit the Pineland dig site. All right, we need another half a bucket. Here, school children come face to face with the past. What's that? That's a piece of pottery. That's a piece of pottery. That's a, this is a clamshell. They walk where Calusa kings and Spanish explorers once walked. They glimpse the lives of a vanished people. In addition, the vast majority of the excavation is performed by trained volunteers, people from every walk of life who have learned the skills necessary to step back into the past one centimeter at a time. I really enjoy when the kids come, because when the kids come and, and stand around and observe, well, then we can point things out to the children, and I really enjoy that. You can go from here to Florida to, to the world, really, and uh, uh, get a much greater understanding of what's happening in, in other areas. So it's not any one particular item that's exciting. It's the whole, whole thing. If you dig back into the past, which we're doing here at Pineland, and you get shells that don't match the modern pattern for a habitat, then you can infer that there might have been an environmental change. Marquard has demystified archaeology by sharing the process of discovery with anyone curious enough to come to a lecture or drive to the dig site. Today, the mangrove thicket that Frank Cushing explored on Marco Island a century ago is gone, wiped away by a force more powerful than a thousand hurricanes, the force of progress. The same fate might have overtaken the Pineland site, but in 1994, Colonel and Mrs. Donald Randell donated more than 50 acres of the site to the Florida Museum of Natural History in the hope that a permanent research center might be established here. Once the funds to support the center have been raised, the site will be open to the public on a permanent basis.
People have lived in South Florida for more than 10,000 years. People much like us. And like us, the Calusa altered the natural state of things to their own advantage. They built mounds to protect themselves from floods. They dug canals that allowed them to travel more efficiently. They secured fresh water, caught fish, and built homes. Yet in that span of over 10,000 years, the Calusa and their predecessors never altered the world around them so drastically that irrevocable damage was done to the natural systems on which they depended for their survival. But in 500 years, the time that has elapsed since Europeans first came to the Americas, the rate of change in the natural systems upon which we depend is catastrophic. Today we face collapsing fisheries, tainted and depleted fresh water supplies, and an unprecedented extinction of plant and animal species. We must face the fact that our way of life may not be as sustainable as that of the Calusa. As we step across the threshold of the 21st century, the knowledge we take with us will be the foundation upon which we stand to meet new challenges. Is it possible that in lessons learned from the Calusa, we may discover fundamental truths that will enable us to live enriching and varied lives 10,000 years into the future? Only time will tell.